Welcome to God is Open. I am your host, Christopher Fisher. Today on God is Open, we're going to be reviewing the book, Frustrating God, How Open Theism Gets God All Wrong. This is going to be more of a covering of their introduction and maybe a little into the first chapter rather than a full review. But have you ever seen perhaps like a train wreck, like slow motion? And, and uh, the trains are getting close to each other. You, you feel it coming. You feel that intensity build up. And this train start to collide. And you're watching it in slow motion as the metal twists and wrecks and, and just smashes together. It's a chaotic scene. And uh, maybe you might get this feeling when watching like a movie or something where the things happening on the screen make you very uncomfortable in an unsettling way. And you... You kind of want to watch the movie, but you want to kind of cover your eyes too because it's just a mess. It's just you it, you can't look away, but you also can't watch it. That's what this book is, Frustrating God. That's what it reminds me of, is a slow motion train wreck, Frustrating God, How Open Theism Gets God All Wrong by Lewis R. Scott. Let's get to know Lewis R. Scott a little bit and just how this book is written. This is a very poorly written book. And so that's one of the reasons I'm reviewing it today because it's it's funny. It's uh, you read it and you're like this this is garbage, and it's a uh, it's a, like a dumpster fire. In fact, in fact, um, God is open. Our podcast has gotten exclusive footage of Lewis R. Scott writing this book. So let, let's play that now. Fantastic! That's a dumpster fire. That is a dumpster fire. So this book is a dumpster fire, and let's talk about why that is. Let's go, for example, to chapter one. What would you expect in a book about contradicting open theism? You'd expect maybe a lot of references, a lot of quotes by open theists, a lot of footnotes, a lot of references to the Bible. Let's kind of scroll through this and take a look. How many Bible verses are referenced? How many footnotes there are? Almost every single paragraph opens with something that he claims that open theism claims, but you don't have quotes. You don't have footnotes. It's almost like he's talking to himself about what he thinks open theists believe, and he doesn't actually address real quotes and real positions and address their real answers to his objections. He's talking to himself. He's talking to himself. There is a clear difference between describing your own belief and refuting someone else's belief. Calvinists do this all the time. Like Matt Slick, he thinks that just describing the things that he believes, that's the same thing as refuting someone else's belief. That's not. That's not. On the God is Open page, it was so funny. I was dealing with this guy, I don't know his name, Jordan or something like that. And I'm not trying to say you're wrong, Jordan. And so he was claiming, oh, here's all my beliefs. And I said, okay, there's different ways to take this evidence. Look at these, these, this, this set of interpretation also fits the data. And then he's like, you didn't prove I was wrong. That's not what I'm going for. I'm trying to say that there's valid alternative translations of the same data. That's what I'm going for. Uh, you're the one who cares about people being right or wrong about this thing. I'm just trying to open your eyes up to other possibilities that you haven't considered. This is not a bait. I'm not trying to convince you of anything except for your myoptic take of your data uh, it, you know, rational people can disagree with it. That was my point. And he, did, he didn't understand. He thought that he equated describing his own beliefs as refuting someone else's belief. Not the same thing. Not the same thing. And this Lewis Scott guy, he doesn't understand the difference either. He says, oh, yeah, he, he goes on these big philosophical rambling rants about nothing. And then he thinks that, oh, because I said it, that's true. And now I've just refuted open theism. I don't think so, dude. I don't think so. So look at this. Poorly sourced. No sources. No footnotes. There, there's once in a while there's an allusion to a verse. But it's all out of context. It's all real bad. We'll be covering that a little bit later as well. Let's go to his preface real quick. So he recounts a time that he's in the army. And he goes to this hospital, and there's a guy in bed, and, and he's, you know, trying to talk to this guy in the bed in the hospital, because he's an army chaplain at the time. And the guy says, oh, you are not going to go to Korea. And he's got orders to Korea at the time, and he thinks, wow, this might be a prophecy from God. And so here's how I'll figure this out. If I don't go to Korea, that means it's a prophecy from God. 
this is this is his logic. He's like, if this is not a prophecy from God, then I will go to Korea. Uh, reminds me of uh, I was doing pro life work on campus in college. You know showing people pictures of the babies that were aborted, aborted babies, showing people what they support. And we had the Center for Bioethical Reform on campus. And with them came a dad and his two daughters. And these people were like, normally there are missionaries to Africa. So they went over to Africa to all these different tribes or what whatnot uh, to be missionaries. And then they'd come back to the States and do pro-life work. But I was talking to one of the daughters and the daughter's a young, attractive lady, and she's a college age, and she's telling me about all these guys, <laughs> all sorts of guys. Just They all walk up to her, you know, one at a time throughout her life, and they say, I have got a message from God. God told me that I am to marry you. <laughs> and she's like, no, no. And, and guess what? All those guys were wrong. But let's pretend, let's pretend that I turned my charm up past 10 on the, on the scale, turned my charm to 11. And I'm like, oh, oh God said that I am going to be with you. And then it turned out to be, be true because my charm is irresistible to the ladies. And then uh, we got married. <laughs> Does that mean, that mean that was from God? Does it? Okay. So this preface is very, ah, I'm reading it. I'm like, oh, this is bad. And he ties it to this. This long series of events, which eventually leads to some back surgery for him. He's saying, because of this prophecy here and me not going to Korea, uh, years down the line, uh, certain events lined up perfectly for me to find the right surgeon for my back surgery. He's like, this was all God's doing, that God, God intervened and stopped me from going to Korea so I could get the right surgeon for my back surgery. Why didn't he just fix your back? That could have been easier. That would save a lot of time. And you could still go to Korea. Oh, what did the prophecy, what did that benefit you? Maybe maybe this little prophecy that turned out to be true that you didn't go to Korea, that bene- gave you some sort of, I don't know what to do it. But uh, very, very superstitious is, is, is my analysis of his preface. Uh, he's like, how can God know all these things? <laughs> how can God send a crazy guy into a hospital to predict my near future. And then a bunch of things happen later in my life that are coincidental, which I ascribe to this. How can that be? How does that work? How could God plan this thing in the future? If God doesn't know and control meticulously everything that happens. Well, I don't, he doesn't say control. He's not like a Calvinist. He's like an Armenian. Oh, but it's funny. It's like, how many coincidences happen in your day-to-day life? Like, like all the time. Like when I was backpacking around Europe and I was in a hostel in Switzerland. I was from South Dakota at the time and we were just rooming in the same room with Stephanie Herseth's aide at the time. She was a senator from uh, South Dakota. It's like, wow, what's a coincidence that in this wide world of six billion people that two people from the same small state in the United States would be at the same hostel at this there's all sorts of coincidences that happen all the time in all sorts of forms and shapes. And for him to just ascribe one of his coincidences that happened throughout his life to this prophecy of not going to Korea, I, I don't get it. I don't get it. Did the prophecy do anything for you? Did it, did it, did it help you make decisions? Or, oh, yeah, it's bad. It's bad. But, oh, man, I also remember... When we were in the hospital with my son's cancer, we met this this young pious Catholic girl, and she she would uh, spend her time praying and worshiping God. She was like sixteen, and she came down with some complicated, like a cancer, like a tumor in her head. And she's the most pious, most loving girl. She worshipped God, spent all her time, you know, in prayer to God, and she ends up dying. She ends up dying. So was that God's meticulous plan for her life? Just, just kill her off? Is is that is that what's going on here? Is he he he'll go and he'll he'll make sure this guy's his back surgery is set up by not bringing him to Korea, but a devout young lady with the rest of her life to live, he'll just let die of cancer. Is is that what's being claimed here? That's kind of that's kind of odd, you know. 
taking a look at these two individuals, if there's one person that probably deserved to live more, it's this young lady and not this weird army chaplain. You know what I'm saying? So I'm not a big fan of this preface. I think it's uh, very stretched, very stretched. And it's just like, look at these coincidences in my life that worked out for the benefit of me. Whereas there's counterexamples all over the world of very pious people and very bad things happening to them. Also that family, that family of five that was killed. I think we did a podcast on that where where they were driving to Colorado to become missionaries and then they were just killed by a trucker. Just dead. Just dead. And that that was part of God's plan. That's 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 what's going on here. That's all these coincidences, this this sleepy truck driver that there's probably a load of coincidences that led up to that. That was God's plan. That's what he's trying to do is kill people. Yeah, kill kill his people. That that's great. Ugh, there's there's a lot of superstitious people. I don't know if I told you guys the story yet or not of my my brother-in-law. <laughs> uh, he he was he's believing in this God is looking out for him type of stuff. And one day he tells me this story. He's like, you know, there was this one time that I had this long trip to go on, and and I left my house. But then I realized I didn't have my keys, so I had to go back in the house and I'd look around for my keys. And I found my keys real quick and I put them in my pocket. I went back out to my car and I started driving. It took me about five minutes to go find my keys. And and as I was driving, I came across an accident that happened five minutes before. God saved me from that accident by making sure that I had to go find my keys. I'm like, what? I said, it made me think about this. You're on the highway. Maybe you being there a little bit earlier would have dis- disrupted the flow of traffic such that 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 accident would have never occurred in the first place. Do you ever think about that? It's not like there's a divine trap there. You're like watching a movie like Final Destination and there's a certain point where people have to die and it's like a divine booby trap and there has to be an accident there and someone has to die and God makes sure it's someone else besides you because he makes you find your keys. Is, is that what's going on here? That's what you think? Uh, no, no, it's... Uh, that's it's it's superstitious thinking. It, that's what that is. Jumping into his introduction, oh, he just makes all sorts of crazy claims. Just okay. Here's how about this: Open theism falls in the camp of those who attempt to define God from a human point of view to satisfy the desire of a philosophical reconciliation between God's sovereignty and human free will. Oh, that's what I'm trying to do. That's what I'm trying to do as an open theist. I'm like. I'm like, how does God's sovereignty interact with human free will? Yeah, that's what I do. Okay, brilliant. Bravo, bravo. And he does this type of stuff. And in his first chapter, he starts talking about how open theism is derived from Greek philosophy. They do this. It's like they're so ignorant. That it's like they don't understand how reality works. For something to be derived from something else, it literally has to have some sort of connection rather than just correlation. How many philosophies are there in this world? You, you, could, you could draw a correlation between all sorts of Christian ideas and non-Christian ideas. To show causation, you got to have something a little bit more. You can have something maybe like we have with Platonism, where the church fathers, they love Platonism. And Augustine said that you could get all your philosophy and you, all your doctrine from Plotinus. And the only use for the Bible is charity or love. Maybe that would be more of a smoking gun. Literally, these guys are projecting that their entire philosophy can be shown and is readily acknowledged by the experts to be influenced and derived from Platonism. And yet they they continually make this weird claim that people are reading like Cicero. (laughs) Like what open theist has read Cicero? I've read some Cicero, but that's... That's after I've been open theist. I've read some Cicero. Uh, who, who is, who's reading this? Who's being influenced? Where? A little bit of evidence. Just making a claim doesn't make it true. You gotta, you gotta show some sort of a derivation. There's, there's, there's gotta be some sort of link rather than just correlation, right? It's like, oh, did you, did you see that video of, of Hitler drinking a glass of water, and then next to it was a like a video of Trump drinking water. Ooh, see, Trump is Hitler. They both drink water. 
Oh, that's nonsense. But literally speaking, Calvinism is Platonism readily admitted by scholarship. It, it's we, We've got the evidence. The evidence is in. It's, we don't have to make these jumps of logic. But let's keep rolling with what he's saying here. He, he references Boyd, Hask. It's like he read one book, maybe two books. So he might have read God of the Possible, and he might have read... Um, probably the openness of God is probably his two books that he's read and he's responding. He doesn't quote them often, which is a really bad thing to do when you're refuting someone is actually quote them in context so that people know that you're not just making things up and not misrepresenting the arguments, but he doesn't do that. And, uh, let's take a look at how he argues. So he says this, the logical conclusion to open theism suggests that if Who's writing this sentence? Again, the logical conclusion to open theism suggests that if God knows the future, then God is the author of evil or must find redeeming value in evil and God's foreknowledge nullifies human free will. I believe open theists are wrong on both points. First, very few people dispute that evil exists in the world. However, it is important to note at the beginning of this discussion that evil is not a creation or a thing per se. So this is an example of what he does. He says, Open theism is wrong because listen to what I believe. <laughs> that, oh, oh, it's painful. That's describing your own belief is not refuting someone else's belief. Again, describing your own belief is not refuting someone else's belief. You have to show why your belief is true and then someone else's belief is false. It's a two-step process. And just describing your own belief is not either of those, <laughs> right? Yeah, it's not, describing your belief is not proving your belief is true, and describing your belief is not proving the other person's belief is false. There, there's a disconnect there. It's the Matt Slick disconnect, the, the Calvinist disconnect, where they, they don't understand this. They, they think just describing their view is advocating their point. Is It's not, it's not. So he says, evil in its broadest definition is the absence of good and not an actively created thing in itself. Wow, that sounds like Platonism is what that is. That sounds directly from Plat Plotinus, from Plato. Ah, oh, it doesn't sound like Christianity. Do you, do you get this from Christianity? That, you know, evil is the absence of good. And this that's the Platonic idea that the material world is a dissension from the perfect world. And the more something changes, the more corrupt it is. And it 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 reflects the previous created worlds, the more perfect worlds, in as much as it doesn't change. You have to return to the perfection. That that's that's Platonism. Okay, so prove your Platonism is true. It just don't say it. I don't believe you when you pretend it's true. I there's no reason for me to accept what you're saying here. You're not providing a reason. He says. Evil is an internal distortion, a virus, if you will, that emerged from within the system and not a result of God's creation. Thus, evil has to be eradicated from within the system, and God achieved that very goal with Jesus, Jesus' entrance into the world. Oh, this is funny. This guy, has he doesn't understand how contradictory he is in all sorts of things he says. So let's fast forward here, and let's look at this paragraph. So just... Remember what he just said, that God has to enter the system to deal with the system. And later he talks about God responding to people and uh, listening. <laughs> but, but in the middle of this is this paragraph about libertarian free will and his issues with libertarian free will. He says, libertarian free will it has been defined as giving people absolute freedom to the point of even influencing God's thinking. This is a false assertion. Cool. <laughs> Wait a minute. What's a false assertion? A definition? How is a definition of false assertion? Is it like you're turning to a dictionary and then libertarian free will says something different? Or libertarian free will is like a concept and can't open theism define the concept that they're using? Oh, no, but keep reading the paragraph. This is just a really poorly worded sentence. This is a false assertion is a reference to people can influence God's thinking, not the definition. Is just poorly worded, this poorly written. He says, human decisions are confined to the created order and cannot extend to God's realm. That God exists outside the created order is not a debatable point. Wow, I guess you're a modalist? 
Is, is that what we're talking about here? So isn't that a heresy under your theology, under normal Christian theology? Doesn't that make you a modalist? I, am I missing something here? Are you a heretic by your own by your own definition of heresy? I don't know if he, he would call modalist heretics. But normally people say modalism is a heresy. So I, I would assume that he would classify himself as a heretic. Because remember that the divine realm can't uh, be influenced by the material realm. And Jesus was in the material realm. So there couldn't be this interface. And it says that this, that the, the created order cannot extend to God's realm. And, and read, read on, clearly any human vol- violation of God's commandments has dire consequences for people, but humans do not have the power to reach heaven and to influence God in any way. Ah, <laughs> oh, so this guy's idea is that the material world cannot interface with the divine world. But later on, he talks about people being responded to by God. He says this, God responds when people come to him in faith. God responds? I thought, flip back a second here. I thought that the created world can't interface with the divine and there's this divide. And Do you, do you just write stuff? Are you just sitting there just writing? Oh, yeah, we got the video clip. Let's watch that again. <laughs> oh, this, this is bad. Okay. All right, we'll keep we'll keep rolling on. So what's your proof text for all of this? Because you, you do provide a proof text. So God exists outside the creative order. And guess what? He adds this. This is not a debatable point. God exists outside the created order is not a debatable point. Done. Finished. He said it's not debatable, guys. So we can't debate it. And, and not only is God outside the created order? And that's not a debatable point, but it's in the sense that uh, Lewis Scott wants. So if you have a way to say, yeah, my belief believes that, he's going to say, no, that's not the way that I see it. And remember, the things I describe about my own beliefs, those are the true things. And we can't debate it. It's not debatable. What I believe is true. And what you believe is false. Because didn't you see me describe my own belief over here? Oh, this is painful. This is painful. It's a dumpster fire. Dumpster fire. But he has his proof text. Solomon, referring to God's dwelling, stated, But will God indeed dwell on earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much this house that I have built. Okay, so your proof text is a man in a story, a historical narrative of a guy saying something. What? That Solomon? So, do we get, we derive our theology from narratives where Solomon's talking? Is that, is that what we're doing now? Like, like, <laughs> like, look at the Bible. Let's pick our people and, and whatever they say about God is true. So if King David says something about God, that must be true. And it must be true in the sense that I think in my own mind and my own philosophy. And who else are some righteous people in the Bible? There's, there's Noah, he's pretty righteous. Job is pretty... Oh, Solomon. Yeah, he is a paradigm of virtue and theological acumen, right? He, he's like the grandest theologian of them all. So anything he says is the same as gospel. So might as well make those narratives in which he's talking. We'll just we'll just flip that. Maybe maybe we could just make that the narrator saying that is, is what we're supposed to do with these historical narratives. So his proof text is a guy talking in a text. And does he look at context to try to understand this? Because maybe Solomon doesn't quite mean that people can't influence God's thinking and that God is outside the created order and humans don't have power to reach heaven and influence God in any way. Is that what Solomon's talking about? Did you turn to the context and read your own context of your own proof text? Did you may, just try that? Did <laughs> Just a little bit? Did you try it? Ugh. All right, Lewis Scott. All right, let let's help you out there. We'll we'll do it because you don't didn't seem to read the own context of your own proof text to see if that makes sense in context. Is that what Solomon's talking about? People can't influence God's thinking and have no power to reach God and influence God in any way. Is is that what that phrase means? Ah, uh, Lewis. 
So 1 Kings 8, 1 Kings 8 is about Solomon building the temple. And then remember Israel's history. Israel is uh, God's chosen people. They, they travel around the wilderness with this tabernacle. And this tabernacle is this tent that they set up. And this tent is a dwelling place for God. And Israel finally gains root in, in the land of Israel. And they don't build a temple for until after David's time. David wanted to build God a temple, but God said, no, your hands are too bloody. Instead, we're going to wait for your son, and your son will build me a temple. The tabernacle and the temple were literally considered places where God dwelt. People would literally turn and pray towards the temple. They would face the temple to pray to the temple. And then there was this idea, as found in 1 Kings 8, the very proof text that he quotes, they would pray towards the temple and then God in heaven would receive their prayers because it was kind of a conduit. It was a, it was a, it was a place where heaven and earth met. And let's turn to Rita Aslan's description of the temple to prove this. This is Rita Aslan in his book, Zealot, describing the temple. And this is a very good book to buy, especially for this part about the temple. He says, the entire liturgy is performed in front of the temple's innermost court, the Holy of Holies, a gold-plated, columnar sanctuary at the very heart of the temple complex. The Holy of Holies is the highest point in all of Jerusalem. Its doors are draped in purple and scarlet tapestries embroidered with the zodiac will and a panorama of the heavens. This is where the glory of God physically dwells. It is the meeting point between the earthly and the heavenly realms, the center of all creation. It is a vast empty space that serves as a conduit for the presence of God, channeling his divine spirit from the heavens, flowing it out in concentric waves across the temple's chambers, through the court of the priests, the court of the Israelites, the court of the women, and the court of the Gentiles, over the temple's Persiled walls and down into the city of Jerusalem, across the Judean countryside to Samaria and uh, Judea, Perinia and Galilee, through the boundless empire of mighty Rome and to the rest of the world, to all the peoples and nations, all of them Jew and Gentile alike, nourished and sustained by the spirit of the Lord of creation, a spirit that has one sole source and no other, the inner sanctuary, the Holy of Holies, tucked within the temple in the sacred city of Jerusalem. So the Israelite cult idea, and I don't use cult in a derogatory sense here, the Israelite cultic idea was the temple was a conduit between heaven and earth. And so they directed their prayers towards Jerusalem or towards heaven. You see either or within the Bible when people are praying. Either, either they lift their voice to heaven or they pray towards Jerusalem. And that way they can focus their prayers to God. And so is that... What, what is Solomon saying that he, there's, he can't dwell in this temple and heaven and earth can't contain him? Is he saying all that's false? He's saying all that cultic practice that we should just override it and throw it away. In context, he, he affirms that this is what's going on, that that's the purpose of the temple. That's, that's the function of the temple. Solomon says, I have surely built you an exalted house, a place for you to dwell in forever. Then the king turned around and blessed the whole assembly of Israel. So he, he said that he built a place for God to dwell forever. So skipping down, let's skip to verse uh, 26. And now I pray, O God of Israel, let your word come true, which you have spoken to your servant David, my father. He's, he's asking him to bring about uh, the promise to David. And if you remember the promise to David, that David's uh, sons would be on the throne forever, there's a conditional element. Uh, originally, when it was given to David, there's no conditional element placed on it. But throughout the Bible, they say, if you follow God, then he will fulfill this covenant with David. But if you don't, he will remove this covenant where a descendant of David would sit on the throne forever. So this is like an eternal conditional promise that King Solomon here is affirming that it is a conditional promise that it might not come true. And is that the idea of someone who thinks that God is outside of time or, or controlling everything or knows the whole future? Contingencies? Contingencies is, it, oh, it's like people who come to the Bible with these preconceptions that that uh, like there's no such thing as contingencies, that the entire future is known by God. It's like you got to just reject the entire text. You just throw it in the trash. It doesn't matter. You just keep reading and uh, you just all that internal feeling where that cognitive dissonance where it kind of hurts when you read those passages. You just you got to ignore that. You got to say, oh, the text doesn't mean what it says. 
keep reading. There's, there's such things as contingencies because of my philosophy that doesn't make sense under any direct scrutiny. And I'll just pretend that it makes sense. But that's what they got to do. Keep reading. But will God indeed dwell on earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you, how much less this temple which I have built. All right, so what does he mean here? Does he mean that God's just very large? That uh, God takes up a lot of space, and this is a kind of a small temple, and that God just can't fit in there. And then the heavens, God is just really large, and so God can't fit in the heavens either. It's it's a space thing. He's So in the middle of this whole thing, he just says, God's a very large person, and he can't fit in the heavens, and he also can't fit in this temple that I built. He's just too large. He's a very big man. I don't I don't think that's what's going on here. I think what he's saying is that God's powerful and God's not going to be tied down to dwelling in this single place. And he might even be referencing the idea that we talked about previously, bodily fluidity, where God could be in sundry locations at the same time. Not that God's omnipresent. God is in our toilet and God is in the gay bathhouse and stuff like that. I don't think that's what he's referring to here. I think he's saying that God's not going to be confined to this little building. This little, you know, our cultic practice is not centered around this being God's only place for that God to be God. God is more powerful. God is more active. God can go out and do things and be places. And he's not confined. He's, he's not going to be limited by this little house. I think that's more likely what's going on here. Let's keep reading and see what his ideas of the temple are. So he says, Yet yeah, regard the prayer of your servant and his supplication. Oh, what? What? Let, let's go read our, our friend again. Humans do not have the power to reach to heaven and influence God in any way. Let's go read Solomon again. Yet regard the prayer of your servant and his supplication. What? (laughs) What? Lewis, you got some explaining to do, Lewis. You got some explaining to do. Humans do not have the power to reach to heaven and influence God in any way. And influence, people can't influence God's thinking. What? Lewis? Lewis, you forgot to read your proof text. You forgot. <laughs> that's that's kind of kind of a big error. <laughs> kind of a big error. He says, "Listen to the cry and the prayer which your servant is praying before you today." Lewis, Lewis, did you, did, did you did you read your proof text? You got some explaining to do, Lewis. You got some explaining to do. That your eyes may be open towards this temple night and day, towards the place of which you said, My name shall be there, and you shall hear the prayer which your servant makes towards this place. What? Lewis! Lewis! Did you, did you see this in the text? The very text you quote? Oh, let's, let's go read Lewis again. Do, do, do. Humans do not have the power to reach heaven and influence God in any way. Lewis! Okay, let's... And may you hear the supplication of your servant and of your people Israel. Lewis! Lewis! Oh! And when they pray towards this place. What? They're praying towards the temple to influence heaven? Here in heaven, your dwelling place. And when you hear, forgive. Lewis! Lewis! You got some explaining to do. Yeah, Your proof text. You got some explaining to do about your proof text. He's here in heaven, here with your ears, here in heaven, your dwelling place, and when you hear, forgive. Let's flip back to Lewis here. Humans do not have the power to reach heaven and influence God in any way. Lewis! Are you hearing? Are you with me, buddy? Are you with me, buddy? When anyone sins against his neighbor and is forced to take an oath and comes and takes an oath before your altar in this temple, remember, Yahweh is a God of oaths. He's an oath enforcer within the text of the Bible because that's, that's, a, that's a property of being omniscient, to seeing all things on earth, is that he sees oaths and he makes sure those oaths are enforced. We've talked about this previously. Then here in heaven, what? Lewis! Lewis! Then hear in heaven and act and judge your servants, condemning the wicked, 
bringing his way on his head and justifying the righteous by giving him according to his right. Lewis, you got some explaining to do, friend. You got a little bit of explaining to do about your proof text. When your people Israel are defeated before an enemy because they have sinned against you, and when they turn back to you and confess your name and pray and make supplication to you in this temple, then here in heaven, Lewis, Lewis, you got some explaining to do, buddy. What, what, God, what? And forgive the sin of your people Israel and bring them back to the land which you gave their fathers. <laughs> when the heavens are shut up and there is no rain because they have sinned against you, and when they pray towards this place, they're praying towards the temple so that God could hear them through the conduit to heaven. And when they pray towards this place and confess your name and turn from their sin because you afflict them, then here in heaven, but Lewis, Lewis, did you, did you see this? Your proof text? Did you, did you see your proof text? Did you read your proof text, Lewis? They pray towards this place and confess your name, turn from their sin because you afflicted them here in heaven, forgive the sin of your servants, your people, and that you may teach them the good way in which they should walk and send rain on your land, which you have given to your people as an inheritance. When there is famine in the land, pestilence or blight or mildew or locusts or grasshoppers, when the enemy besieges them in their land or cities, whatever plague or whatever sickness there is, whatever prayer, whatever supplication is made by anyone or by all your people, Israel, when each one knows the plague in his own heart and spreads out his hands towards the temple, then here in heaven, Lewis, Lewis, are you seeing this? Are you with me, buddy? Then here in heaven, your dwelling place, and forgive and act and give everyone according to all his ways, whose heart uh, you know, and you alone know the hearts of all the sons of men, that they may fear you all the days that they have to live on the land which you gave to their fathers. Oh, okay. So here in heaven, hear with your ears, listen in heaven, God's in heaven, people pray towards the temple, and it's brought to God in heaven. That. That's what Solomon's describing here. And so going back to Solomon, the proof text that Lewis Scott uses for God being totally devoid outside space and time, he can't interact with the world. Is that what Solomon's going for? Is that what Solomon's going? Did you read the context? What does the context suggest? That your philosophy, that you really want to be true. Uh, Solomon endorses it, but then talks this entire speech, a long speech over and over again, violating this concept that you think he just set down. He's talking metaphysics. Now he's talking nonsense. That's your position, your position that God keeps hearing in heaven and responding to events on earth. You throw that in the trash because you want to take this little phrase by Solomon somewhere else. And you want your own specific ideas on that. Lewis, Lewis, you're naughty. Naughty, you need a spanking. This is bad theology. Bad theology. Naughty, Lewis. Naughty. Oh, man. It's, it's, it's like, again, a Calvinist, and in this case, an Arminian, they don't read their proof texts. It's like they quote a verse, and they're ignorant, just completely ignorant of the context. It's like just basic scholarship they don't have. They are desperate for proof text, so much so that he quotes a man talking in a historical narrative, and that's his proof. That's his theology that he derives from a character in a text giving a monologue. That's not the narrator. That's not God. And then all the times God talks throughout the Bible about where he lives and who's in his presence. Remember, the narrator says that Cain leaves the presence of the Lord, and God says, I will dwell in this temple. And then you have the... Ezekiel describing how God leaves the temple, that he witnesses God leaving the temple in Ezekiel. And, and in Revelation, when the author says that God descends from heaven and lives with man forever, all those are discarded because you got your Platonistic philosophy based off of a small vague clip that you get from Solomon, a character in the text who could be fallible, who is not, uh, the kingdom's actually pulled away from Solomon in the text. Remember we, we said that this eternal promise to David was conditioned on faithfulness. It's taken away from Solomon. He's not like a righteous dude. He's not a person that when we talk about key biblical figures, 
he ranks among the key ones, but not as like a righteous one. He's got all these wives going on. He's got all this turmoil in his kingdom. He's, he's not King David. He's not his father. God doesn't love him the same way. He's, he's not on that level. He's not on the level. And that's your go-to proof text, Lewis Scott. That's your go-to proof text for your belief. It's bad theology. It's bad theology. Where's the spanking stick? Where's the spanking stick? All right, I got so much more on this guy. And I could go on for a lot longer, but we're going to have to cut us off for time. Go to his book on, on uh, Amazon, and I left a review. Read the review. And if you like the review, upvote the review. So it's like the number one review on this guy's book. If you don't like the review, uh, tell me why. That's one thing. Like if you're downloading my videos, tell me why. Even if it's like anonymously, just send me an email from an anonymous email and say, this is why I downloaded your video. Maybe it's like, you're not a nice guy. I'll say, that's a good criticism. But someone downvotes and says, this theology point was wrong. Then, then I have something to go on. I got some sort of feedback to look for improvements and then to think about why, you know, downvotes are happening or why you don't like something I do or say. And I'll take those criticisms for me being mean. I never claim to be a very nice guy. But, but go, go read that review on Amazon um, and uh, upvote, downvote it, whatever, whatever, you, if you like it or not. That's fine. This is this is a funny book. It's a cheap book. So if you want to get it on Kindle for four bucks, you could read through it and see if I'm just making this stuff up where he doesn't cite his sources. He's bad at footnoting. He's bad at representing open theism. And he doesn't understand that open theists have responded to the arguments that he makes. So he, he it doesn't seem like he's ever interacted with the open theist in his life. And he just goes on these rants. Ah. Anyways, if you've got questions or comments on this podcast, uh, send them to godisopenquestions at gmail.com, or you can post uh, comments. I respond to all the comments that uh, come on these videos, or start a thread on the God is Open Facebook page. Thank you for listening.